We are back today to talk about, to begin to talk about one of the important questions in Latin American history, and that is how Latin America became modern. We're not going to talk so much about modern Latin America today. Actually, we're not going to talk about modern Latin America at all. Uh, you will hear a lot about that during the second part of the semester. What we are going to talk about today, what I'm going to talk about in the first part of class today, and what our guest speaker, Professor Guillermo de los Reyes of the Department of Modern and Classical Languages is going to talk about in the second part of class today. What we are going to talk about today are the steps that um, Latin America experienced, the processes that Latin America went through as it went from being a colony to being a series of independent, a, a large number of independent nations. We have talked already this semester about the birth, the institutionalization, and the visual culture of colonial Latin America. We have also touched upon the very important subject of race, which is an issue I will be coming back to today. Um, but in order to grasp the nature of modern Latin America, we must grapple with, we must come to some understanding of the late colonial period and the period of the independence movements. And these are today's subjects. In thinking specifically about the late colonial period, which is what I'm primarily going to focus on in my part of class today, we need to consider the following issues. And here we can look briefly at uh, the beginning of the outline for today. Uh, we need to talk about the issues of race and class in colonial Latin America. One of the important things that happened in the late colonial period, and by the way, the dates for the late colonial period are 1700 to, and then the end date, of course, depends on which specific country in Latin America we're talking about, because the countries became independent uh, around the same time but in different years. So in Mexico, we talk about 1821 as the year for independence. In Bolivia and some other of the countries of South America, we talk about 1823, 24, 25. Um, but let's say, in order to be inclusive, let's say that the dates for the late colonial period go from 1700 to 1825. Uh, and in that 125-year period, an enormous amount of change took place. And it will be important to consider the issues of race and class in colonial Latin America because some of the ways that society began to change, some of the important social changes that took place, are linked in very fundamental ways to the political changes that do take place early in the 19th century. So the topics that I'll be talking about and covering uh, today include race and class in colonial Latin America. Then I want to talk about some of the other important changes that took place. Some of these have to do with population. And here I'll be talking about numbers, uh, population figures, and economic change, because I'm going to argue, one of the things I'm going to argue today is that there was a critical link between the population changes that took place and the economic changes which then transp transpired. Uh, I'll also be talking about the Bourbon reforms. And I'll explain to you exactly what that term refers to and has nothing to do with alcohol. And then I'm going to argue that all of these changes that I have laid out by the period, well, certainly in the second half of the 18th century, but really from about 1780 into the early 19th century, the culmination, the coming together of all these changes will lead in Latin America to the development of a more rebellious climate. And out of that more rebellious climate generally, in combination with 
um, political and political, legal, and economic changes elsewhere in the Western world, out of that more rebellious climate will emerge the independence movements. And by 1825, a colony which seemed very stable, and really I should be talking about two colonies because we're talking about both Spanish America as well as Portuguese America, that is Spanish America and Brazil, um, colonies which seemed very stable in 1700. Uh, and these colonies in 1700 had lasted uh, almost, by then already, almost 200 years. Colonies which seemed very stable in 1700, by 1800 were anything but. And what seemed like it would always go on in a certain sense, um, and what seemed much more stable and much more bureaucratically unified and uniform than the 13 British colonies. What seemed stable underneath it all, there were so many changes taking place that stability really was more of an illusion. And by 1825, Latin America is for the most part independent. Uh, the countries that come into being in 1825 are not the countries that exist today in 2007, but the process of independence began and will end in a place, will end in continents, really in a hemisphere that is dramatically different by 1825 than it was in 1700. But let's go back to what I think is the beginning of change. And the beginning of change is a sort of natural process by which the many of the issues and the changes and the transformations that took place in the period shortly after 1521 in Mexico, in the 1530s in Peru and other parts of South America, those processes of change that have been associated with the conquest, well, one of the things that happens is that there begins to be, in a sense, more stability. Um, as I just remarked, in some senses, that stability is an illusion. But there is, I, I think it's fair to say that there is some reality to it, because what is stable and what I think is so interesting about colonial Latin America in the 17th and in the 18th centuries is that it becomes its own place. And that's really what is um, so important about the late colonial period. Latin America becomes its own place. It is not the Americas of 1491. That is, it is no longer the Americas of independent, sovereign, highly varied indigenous peoples and cultures, nor is it Europe, nor is it Africa. And Africans, as Professor Howard uh, talked to us about, Africans represented a very important component of society, of the economy, and of the political system in colonial Latin America. But the Latin America of the 17th and 18th century has become much more its own place. And I think the best way to explore that is to talk about the system of and ideas of race as these developed over time in the colonial period. And what's also important about what happened in the 17th and 18th century, especially during the 18th century, is that the system of racial hierarchy increasingly gave way to a system of class hierarchy. And this is not to say that race became less important. What it is to say, because to this day, race is a very important marker of social difference and social hierarchy throughout Latin America. But race 
race retained a place in terms of the way that people thought about social differentiation during the colonial period, but class became an increasingly important marker of social differentiation. People became, by 1700, much more aware of class differences, and class figured in in new ways to the ways that Latin Americans began to think about their own societies. But before we talk about class, we do need to talk about race in more detail. During the early colonial period uh, in the 16th century and in the 17th century, it would be fair to say that race was the primary means of ordering the colonial social hierarchy. So as I said, social hierarchy or social asymmetry were described, and the differences that were part of that hierarchy, those differences were described predominantly in racial terms. What were the racial groupings? And who was a part of them? And what were the differences among those racial groupings? And by the way, before I talk more about the racial groupings, let me just say a couple of things about that I think are worth keeping in mind about race more generally. The first one is that while there are some racial markers that have a biological basis. That is, we know that there are differences in skin color. There are some other kinds of differences uh, that are characteristic of what we recognize to be the predominant racial groupings in the world today. I think the most important way that we can understand race is really to think of race as a cultural and social a set of cultural and social phenomena as a cultural designation, as a set of categories. Race really is a way that we and people in the past have thought about different groups in society. We use physical, physical markers to designate racial groups, but what's most important about race is not those physical markers, because a lot of biological anthropologists who study race would argue that the differences within any racial group are actually greater than the differences among racial, racial groups. So what's really important about race, I think the most important thing about it actually, is that it's a sort of cultural typology, it's a way of thinking about differentiation. It's very basic to Western ways of thinking about the world, categories of race, um, ideas about race are recognized throughout the world. But race is particularly salient in societies in the West as a way of thinking about differentiation. But race has some social consequences. It's not just a cultural, it's not just a set of cultural definitions. Race has social consequences, it has social meaning. What do I mean by that? What I mean is very simple. Uh, if you are designated in one group, your life is going to be different in certain ways, and this was true past and present, than if your designation were something else. In other words, it affects your daily life, it affects your life course. So race uh, has both cultural meaning and social consequences. And these far outweigh, I think, the biological aspects and characteristics of race that 19th and early 20th century scholars concentrated on so much. Uh, so I think it's important to, to understand that as I talk about race today, I'm talking about it primarily as a cultural and social, social phenomenon. Also, um, I want to argue about race that its meanings changed over time. And in 1521, when we talk about race, what we're often actually talking about is ethnicity. 
because indigenous people did not think of themselves in racial terms. In 1521, Spaniards maybe were beginning to think about themselves in racial terms because, and the Spanish and Portuguese were actually very important in the evolution of uh, ideas of race because both of that history of religious diversity that I talked about when, earlier in the semester when I talked about the history of Spain and the history of Iberia because Spaniards thought about Catholicism and they thought about Judaism and Islam not only as representing different religions but they thought about those categories as representing different ways of life that were very fundamental. And out of those religious differences, some scholars argue that that actually laid the basis for the evolution of the first ideas of race. But in 1521, Iberians were also uh, already familiar with Africa and enslavement. And those ideas also figure in in key ways to the development of race. So without spending a lot of time on it, Spaniards by 1521 had begun to think about and use concepts of race. But when we're talking about that early period, I think the idea of ethno-race is very critical. That emerging ideas of social differentiation were rooted around a kind of combination of ethnicity and race. Over time, especially in the 17th and 18th century, then we have the evolution of ideas that are more clearly racial, as we would think of them today, even though the definitions maybe of race and the way that race functioned in society in colonial Latin America in 1700 was quite different from the way race functions in North America or in Europe in the early 21st century. But be that as it may, I think I will use the term race as a kind of shorthand, but I do want to uh, emphasize this idea that ethnicity was a part of it and that there were important developments and shifts over time in terms of ideas of race. But what were the important racial groups? Um, of course, and I, I will start with the top and move through the bottom, though an interesting point also to make is that it's very easy to define what the top was in racial terms. It's not easy to define the bottom in colonial Latin America. And that's, I think, one of the things that makes colonial Latin American history really interesting and makes it contrast in interesting ways with the colonial history of North America. But I'll come back to this point of the difficulty of talking about who is at the bottom in a little bit. Who's at the top, of course, are Spaniards. And in the 16th and 17th century, they are not referred very often uh, they are not referred to very often in racial terms. That is, they're not referred that often. They're not called blancos or whites very often. They're usually uh, referred to as Spaniards, but there are two important terms, and these terms are on my outline, peninsulars and creoles. And these are the important terms for Spaniards in the New World. Peninsulars, pretty easy to figure out who those Spaniards are. Those are the really the top dog Spaniards. Uh, those are Spaniards who had been born in Spain and who had been sent to or migrated voluntarily to the New World. And those that were sent, these weren't the prison convicts of Australia, those that were sent were sent usually to take high office in church or state. But these were the highest of the high. They held the highest position. Um, the conquerors themselves didn't come from such wealthy or illustrious backgrounds. But once we get into the mid-16th and into the 17th century, well, these were people who were coming from pretty important families and from very good backgrounds in Spain. And they thought of themselves as being at the top of that hierarchy. Uh, Spaniards who were born in Latin America were known as Creoles. That's the term we use in English. Uh, and the term Creole in different places and at different points of time can have different meanings. I'm well aware of that. 
But for our purposes, a Creole is someone who is a Spaniard but born in Latin America. The term in Spanish is Criollo. And um, Creoles were often very wealthy because over time Creoles, many Creoles, uh, managed to accumulate quite a bit of wealth, but they weren't quite as at the top of the social and economic hierarchy as Peninsular Spaniards, but the groups, Peninsulars and Creoles, were closely related to each other. It is important to point out, however, that the Spanish population, especially the Creole Spanish population, filled a variety of occupations and sometimes these included low prestige ones. So while many Spaniards were wealthy and socially prominent, there were those who were not. A way to say this, another way to explain that idea is that the highest and wealthiest elites were always Spanish in colonial Latin America. But being Spanish did not guarantee one wealth, especially from the 17th century on. Peninsulars considered themselves, as I already mentioned, to be more elite than Creoles, but often this was a matter more of prestige than wealth. Peninsulars tended to hold the highest posts in colonial administration in both state as well as in the religious realm. Peninsulars also dominated commerce, especially overseas commerce. And that was the kind of commerce or trade that, that generated the most income and that had the most prestige. Creoles, on the other hand, in contrast, dominated land holding and mining. And by 1600, Creoles were very well represented among local office holders. So peninsulars tended to dominate the higher offices, Creoles, tended to dominate local office positions and the lower bureaucracy. Wealthy Creoles throughout the colonial period resented peninsular snobbishness. Nonetheless, they often tried to marry their daughters to wealthy peninsulars in order to create marriage alliances which would enhance family standings and family fortunes. And that was interesting because those marriages between Peninsulars and Creoles, there was motivation on both sides of that social, it's not really a divide exactly, but there was motivation on both sides in terms of that social differentiation for such marriages because Peninsulars had access to wealth, but what they really had was access to social prestige, and that was important. Creoles often had access to great wealth. And so peninsulars were motivated to try to marry a son or daughter or their sons or daughters into Creole families. And both sides gained something from that mix. We started with Spaniards because they were at the top, but they were the smallest. Uh, in general, they were the smallest group. Spaniards did migrate, but they did not migrate in the large numbers that the English did to British North America. So while Spaniards were an important component of the population, and especially in cities, especially the largest and capital cities, Spaniards were an important co component of the population, they actually were a relatively small component of the population. The largest component of the population throughout the colonial period and here, once we get beyond Spaniards, we do get into these important and complex questions about the racial hierarchy and how is it defined and what did it mean. The largest component overall in colonial Latin America and in most, though not all parts, because I will uh, talk a little bit about some of the variation in terms of the racial differentiation of the population. The largest component of the population in colonial Latin America was the indigenous or Indian population. Prior to the arrival of Europeans, as we've talked about, the New World was home to a vast number of different cultural and linguistic groupings. 
The largest groups, such as the Aztec or the Inca, were themselves internally stratified so that they had clear class and occupational structures. One of the important effects of the conquest was over time to compress those structures. Status differences within Indian groups did not totally disappear, but they tended to become vastly simplified. Secondly, one of the important effects of colonial rule was to create a racial grouping, that is Indian or Indio, that had not existed before. As part of the so-called Republica de Indios, that sector of colonial society, and legally, through much of the colonial period, an aspect, and the, the term Republica de Indios was actually a legal term. Legally, what that term referred to was the idea that the indigenous population was different and separate socially, ethno-racially, if you will, and legally separate from the Spanish population. Indians had, as members of the Republica de Indios, certain special legal rights. They actually had the right to self-rule as long as the practices of self-rule did not contradict the fundamental teachings of the church and the important laws and policies, especially having to do with tribute and labor, and we talked about that in a lot of detail, uh, as long as those policies and those practices of self-rule did not contradict, contradict the important teachings of the church and the basics of colonial political and economic policy. Special Indian courts were created as part of the Republica de Indios to hear Ind Indian lawsuits. In most cases, Indians did not have to bear the costs of their litigation. And Indian communities retained rights to specific lands, water, now, when we get to mineral rights, then it's another question. That is subsurface, the rights to subsurface uh, material wealth, that was, that was another question. But in terms of uh, rights to land and a limited kind of self-rule, the Indian population defined both socially and in terms of ethno-race, ethno did have very specific rights as well as obligations. These obligations, of course, centered around the fact that Indians labored under almost intolerable burdens and demands in terms of labor and taxation. Mine and Obrahe workers, Obrahe's being a small proto-industrial factories. Mine and Obrahe workers performed labor in truly awful conditions. And Indian populations were seen by, by Spaniards as an endless source of tribute revenue for church and state. These pressures often led to out-migration from traditional communities into cities as indigenous people, both men and women, more men than women, but this affected both women, men and women, as People who had grown up in traditional indigenous communities began throughout the colonial period to migrate in ever greater numbers into cities. And that process of migration disrupted traditional family kinship and communal networks. In a legal sense, Indians were probably of higher status than Africans, and I will talk about Africans next, uh, who had fewer legal rights because of enslavement. But socially, the issue of race and rank was quite complicated. Africans came to Latin America predominantly as slaves, but in the early part of the 16th century, some Africans 
who played an important role in the conquest and early post-conquest period, came as free as freed people. Those Africans who came as free or were freed in that very early period were important for the roles they played in the conquest and in the establishment of what becomes a more stable and mature colony. But they're also important because they occupied an intermediary social position between Spaniards and Indians. Because Indians were defeated in the conquest, their culture devalue, devalued and their labor coerced, Africans were often, during the 16th century, considered to be more skilled and more valuable laborers. In cities, Africans often worked as skilled laborers in European introduced crafts in areas like textile production and bread making. They also often headed the domestic staffs of the households of the wealthiest elite. Yet the experience of most African slaves, of course, was a very negative one. Eventually, most of the Africans brought to Spanish and Portuguese America were brought as slaves. And providing agri agricultural field labor was the dominant experience. And it was, of course, associated with extremely coercive work and living conditions and very high mortality rates. Africans, whether enslaved or free, were often punished very severely, more severely than Indians. And while in some parts of Latin America, most notably Brazil, as well as the Spanish Caribbean, in those parts of Latin America, Africans survived as a separate sector of the population up until today. In many parts of Spanish America, high rates of interracial relationships and marriage created a large racially mixed group of people who were known as Costas. And I'll come back to uh, talk about the Costas in a minute. Um, as, as time went on and as more racial groups as a product of interracial mixing developed, in many areas of Spanish America, Africans tended over time to blend into the mixed racial groupings, except for those areas that I talked about. In some other regions of, of Spanish America, such as in the region that will become Argentina, there were parts of, of that region where African po uh, and a separate and identifiable African population lasted well into the 19th century. But in many parts of Spanish America, Africans tended over time to blend into the mixed racial groupings. And it's the emergence of these mixed racial groupings, or castas, that is an especially important phenomenon in the social history of colonial Latin America, and that plays a very important role in the evolution of ideas not only about race, but about class as well. And it plays the emergence of Costa populations, plays a role also in the emergence of class as an increasingly important, not just economic source of differentiation, but a social source of differentiation as well. Let me talk briefly about interracial relationships and marriages and the costas. Throughout the colonial period, Latin America produced large, ever larger numbers of mixed race peoples. In the early colonial period, this was a dynamic that developed because a lot more men migrated than women. That was especially true in the first part of the 16th century. But overall, uh, the numbers of women who migrated, the numbers of Spanish women who migrated were never close to the numbers of Spanish men who migrated. And Spanish men turned to other women, women of other groups, for partners. And some of those relationships were formalized through marriage, and many were not. As time went on, the dynamic in terms of the growth of the mixed race population 
relates to the fact that mixed race people began to find partners who were themselves of mixed race. When historians talk about the mixed race groupings, they often use the word casta, which comes, uh, of course, and is related to the uh, English word for caste. Um, they often use the word casta as a sort of general term to describe mixed race populations generally. But mixed race populations had several important components that could be differentiated. And one of the real interesting things in, during the late colonial period is the way that mixed race people began to make uh, some increasing distinctions among themselves. There were those people whose ethno-racial backgrounds were predominantly a mixture of Indian and Spanish. Those people were and are known as mestizos. In many parts of Latin America today, most people, no matter how they designate themselves culturally, most people are of mestizo, um, mestizo background in both a cultural and biological sense. For those people who are or were predominantly of mixed African and Spanish background, these people were known generally as mulattoes or mulattas for women. Um, but there were a number of different terms that were used to describe people of mixed African and Spanish background depending on the relationship and how far back the African and Spanish um, relatives went if one traced one's heritage. But mulatto was the dominant term. Now there also were terms which I did not put on the outline because they vary a lot. There were also terms used to describe people of mixed African indigenous background. And in many parts of Latin America, especially in the largest cities, in Mexico City, for example, there were lots of those people. But in Mexico City versus Lima versus Quito or some of the other large cities in, um, in uh, like Buenos Aires or in Ecuador or in what's today Bolivia, the terms that were used for those mixtures were highly variable, so there's not one term that I can give you that describes those, that's used to describe those people. But what's interesting in the 18th century is that a whole variety of terms developed to describe many of these alternative Costa possibilities and identities, and these terms did vary somewhat regionally. While the Spanish crown, for the most part, discouraged intermarriage between Spaniards and members of other group, ethnic groups, especially in the second half of the colonial period, Costas were becoming, as I said, a larger group throughout the colonial period. Whereas estimates of New Spain's, that is Mexico's, Costa population suggest that in 1570, in all of New Spain, there were only about 5,000, and that estimate may be somewhat low, but it gives us it's a, it's a ballpark figure that gives us a base. In 1793, it is estimated that the Costa population in New Spain was around a million, maybe a little bit larger, which made the Costa population the second largest group in colonial Mexican society after Indians. Uh, and in many cities, Costas were the largest grouping. Socioeconomically, in class terms, and I'll come to the issue of class in just a minute, socioeconomically, Costas were often a middle, often a kind of lower middle, but a sort of middle group. They performed many mid-level economic functions and were culturally closer to Spaniards than were Africans or Indians. Throughout the 18th century, Costas made determined efforts to assimilate and raise themselves in status. This has raised the question of whether class began to overtake race and ethnicity as the major form of socioeconomic classification during the late colonial period. And that's the issue, class, that I want to move on to. Um, but, well, let's not go ahead in the outline just yet. 
Uh, I, before I talk about class, I do want to make one point about the Africans who came uh, because I started to make it and then moved on. I do want to make one point about the Africans who came in the very early colonial period and the reason why the reasons why they had a sort of mid-level status. Many of those first Africans were free when they came. Others were freed uh, after they got here. But even those who were enslaved, interestingly enough, so legally they had the lowest position. But socially, and one of the reasons why figuring out who's at the bottom isn't so easy, is because socially, not only did these first Africans have skills in terms of work that Spaniards highly valued, Spaniards thought of these first Africans as more skilled than Indians, and they relied on them not only to perform certainly certain kinds of highly skilled labor, but they relied on them also to transmit their knowledge to Indians in mines, in mine work, for example. That was very, that was very common. Um, but many of those Africans, especially those who did come as free, did not come directly from Africa. Many actually came either from Spain or Portugal or from the South Atlantic Islands off the western coast of Iberia where slavery and sugar plantations already existed before, they, uh, before these were formed in the Americas. These Africans who had been brought to the Atlantic Islands or to Iberia itself were acculturated in important ways, ways that were impo important to the colonial project, projects of both Brazil and Spain but especially for the Spanish. They were acculturated religiously. That is, they had already been converted to Catholicism. They were acculturated linguistically and culturally. They, many of them spoke either Spanish or Portuguese. And they were accustomed to Iberian ways of doing things beyond the working world. They had lived in cities like Castile, Lisbon, or some of the other large important cities. And they were well accustomed either through their own learning or they had been born into. If they had been born in Iberia, they had been born into a culturally diverse, very racially stratified but nonetheless culturally diverse world. And so those first Africans had an important in-between status. That's a relatively small number compared to the millions who were eventually brought as part of the transatlantic slave trade to perform agricultural labor. But socially, uh, socially and legally, the, the presence of those early freed or enslaved but acculturated Africans was very important because it was part of the formation of a social world in which there was at one and the same time both some pretty clear ideas about racial hierarchy, yet there was some flexibility within that hierarchy because of the diverse communities and the patterns of diversity vary regionally. And, so, and within these communities, diverse groups uh, have to learn to coexist in certain ways. But the presence of these early Africans was also important because it blurred some of the legal classifications that in terms of Spanish law especially, Portuguese law was a lot clearer, but in terms of Spanish law there was a kind of contradiction throughout the colonial period between the legal position of enslaved Africans who clearly were at the bottom of the hierarchy and the social reality which was more complex and flexible. 
because Africans throughout much of the colonial period, some, small in number, but some had a kind of middle position that made them important in the social, in the social hierarchy and in the, working, in the working world. And these diverse groups of people were related in important ways, as I've already said, to the kinds of social, ethnic, racial, and cultural mixing that took place throughout the colonial period. Well, Spaniards still thought from 1521 to 1825 Spaniards still thought that social hierarchy and social distinctions and distinctiveness were very important. But what I want to argue is that over time, especially when we get into the 18th and early 19th century, over time, class became increasingly important. Let me again start at the top. Colonial elites were made up of high-ranking bureaucrats and churchmen as well as wealthy ranchers and plant owners, mine owners, and merchants. All members of the elite were under a surprising degree of financial pressure. And the ranks of the elite often saw, actually saw downward mobility rather than upward mobility. Because colonial economies were cyclical, with boom periods often followed by serious declines, and my point there will be picked up in the second part of the semester when we talk more about the development of Latin American economies. Because that pattern of boom and bust is something that has characterized the economies of Latin America from the colonial period on. But because colonial economies were, cyclicals, were cyclical, Elites often had to try to diversify their holdings. I already mentioned marriage as a strategy that had some important economic motivations as well as consequences. And elites often also tried to invest in a variety of, a variety of different kinds of commodities and ventures in order to diversify their uh, incomes and to maintain a flow of capital. But often what they were most interested in investing in was land. And as much as Latin America was by 1750 or 1800, even 1700, as much as Latin America was a, monet uh, was a monetized economy, Investment in land was important, and land was a very important commodity that held a great deal of value. Another kind of pressure on members of the elite was that while high bureaucrats often came from wealthy families and received high salaries, they also had to make substantial investments to buy their offices and pay the costs of setting up new households as they came to or moved around the new world. Office holders also often had to pay taxes. For example, in Spanish America, it was the policy from about 1650 on that appointees to office had to pay one half of their first year's salary as a tax. The Spanish crown was constantly scrambling for revenue, and the selling of office and the special taxation of office holders was a way that Spaniards, and the Spanish crown in particular, raised revenue. At the top of society, when we talk about elites, class and race map pretty closely together. Not 100%, 100% of the time, they do map pretty well together. When we get into the middle and lower groups, again, it's much more flexible, it's much more complex, there's a lot more diversity. But again, we can see that ideas about class and economic position become increasingly important over time. What were the middle groups? Middle groups were especially common in urban areas where there was a wider socioeconomic spectrum than in rural areas where class differences tended to be starker. At the top of the urban middle sector were manufacturers, master artisans, 
retail merchants, middle-ranking officials of the colonial government, and lower-level priests. Priests and bureaucrats were the most secure because while their salaries were modest, their salaries were steady. Other groups were more dependent on market condition and often copied elites by trying to diversify economically. But when we get to the middle and lower groupings, one of the ways of diversifying economically wasn't so much through investment, though there were some of that uh, attempts to invest in land, for example, uh, but it was harder even at the middle, even at the middle level. Uh, but there were one of the important strategies was a sort of family strategy of diversification because at the middle and lower level, it's a lot more common for um, many members of families to work, including women. And we think of colonial society as one that was very restrictive for women, and in many ways it was. Uh, it was, in terms of hierarchy and gender, a very hierarchical society, nonetheless at middle and lower levels. It was quite common for women to work, and children worked as well. So the diversification strategy economically often had to do with the family rather than investment, investment per se. Other kinds of strategies at the middle level, for example, craftsmen often organized collectively. They uh, organized into guilds. And they did that to pool purchasing power, to pool savings, and also to try to prevent competition. Because in urban areas, there was so much migration in and out, there were always people moving into cities who were ready to undercut the prices of different kinds of products produced or the prices paid for the performance of different kinds of services. And guilds were a way to try to control that competition. Even skilled crafts, craftspeople, mostly craftsmen, but women sometimes either uh, worked in the area of crafts or they were part of household workshops in which everybody's labor was part of the production system. Craftspeople, craftsmen were vulnerable economically. It was hard to own their own shops. They had to accumulate a fair amount of capital in order to, do, to own their own shops and or homes. And it was not uncommon for craftsmen and other people in the middle sector to flee creditors by moving to other cities or regions. It was pretty easy to get into debt and to need to get your tail out of there. Retail sellers also could be found among the middle group, generally owning small neighborhood shops and diversifying by selling alcoholic beverages or maintaining gambling establishments or having those two things together come together. Um, rural areas also had middle groups. Rancheros represent such a group. Um, these were people who owned, mostly men who owned smaller, smaller farms rather than large haciendas, and they often produced for regional or local markets, not for the largest cities. There also was a huge poor sector. And one of the things we should think about when we think about the class structure is that it really, much more neatly than the racial structure, can be thought of as having a triangular or pyramidal shape. And as we go down the class hierarchy, the numbers of people who are encompassed in the major groupings get larger and larger. Poverty was a pervasive characteristic of urban and rural life during the colonial period. Urban areas had large and diverse poor groups. The upper tier of the urban poor was made up of less skilled craftsmen, market and trade people such as peddlers, servants, and soldiers. The bottom tier constituted what we could call an underclass. Beggars, thieves, prostitutes, the impoverished victims of accidents or disease. For the laboring poor and for this underclass in colonial Latin America, their lives were not easy. The laboring poor worked from sunrise to sunset six days a week. 
In urban areas, in artisan shops and obrajes, minimal meals might be provided, and employees often slept actually at their places of work, and housing and food would be considered part of the compensation, thereby lowering wages. Wages were low and changed very little over extended period of time. That is our notion that if you do a good job, you should get a raise, not a colonial idea. Few unskilled workers actually manage to work 52 weeks a year, which helps account for the high rates of employment, especially for poorer women whose work in markets, small stores, and as domestic servants often provided much needed income for their families. For the poverty-stricken underclasses, what assistance there was came largely from the church through orphanages, homes, hospitals, and religious brotherhoods or cofradias. Uh, some assistance might come from the guilds or gremios that I mentioned before. And some, of course, did come from families. And that family strategy of as many people working as possible, of course, um, was related to family survival and sometimes to helping those weaker members of a family or kin group who could not really take care of themselves. But begging and illegal activities such as thievery or prostitution were also activities that were associated very actively with the urban underclass. In rural areas, there was a smaller middle group and a larger poor group. But much of the poor consisted of Indians still attached to their communities. While materially very poor and often laboring in very stressful conditions, they still had access to a range of communal social institutions, families, kin groups, religious groups, which could be helpful in times of need. And I think most social historians believe that the notion of a social network or fabric that functioned to keep people in sort of a steady state was stronger in many rural areas than it was in cities. But there, also, there was a rural underclass. This consisted of those people who, for a variety of reasons, detached themselves from their communities of birth, who migrated to haciendas, plantations, or mines to work. They were always the first fired when these enterprises fell on hard times, and often then would migrate to cities looking for work or shelter. So we can't think of the rural world as totally separate from the urban world. They, as they are today, they were very interconnected with each other in a variety of ways. Nonetheless, there are some important urban differences between the urban world and the rural world not only in terms of race, but also in terms of class. To finish up talking about race and class, social historians have found that a transition from race to class as the predominant form of socioeconomic classification was taking place during the late colonial period. Wealth and power remained associated most closely with Spaniards throughout the colonial period, but racial boundaries also became increasingly blurred over time, in large part because of the emergence of this ever larger Costa group. As cities grew, and as mixed race peoples had increasing access to higher status occupations, class and occupation tended to become more important in determining an individual's social position. Uh, and this was a product of the emergence of new ethno-racial groupings, as I've talked about. It's also related to some of the larger population changes, which I will get into in a minute. But a really interesting um, aspect of what happens in terms of race and class in the late colonial period is that while people become ever more concerned with class and class position, uh, and there's a new kind of ostentation in terms of wealth for the wealthiest people that becomes very obvious in the late colonial period. Race and class mixed in some pretty interesting ways. 
In the 18th and early 19th century, in many parts of Spanish America, it was actually possible for, and this was primarily the case for mixed race people, not so much for uh, Indians and Africans, it was possible to purchase something that is known in English as a certificate of whiteness. And a certificate of whiteness meant that you could, if you could purchase one of these, you could get yourself classified as white, even though in your birth record, for example, your parents' race was noted and your racial background, one's racial background, uh, one's mixed racial background was, was defined in birth and other kinds of records. It was possible to get through purchase a certificate of white, whiteness or a cedula de gracias al sacar that would mean that from there on in any legal document you would be referred to as a Spaniard. So that what's interesting about that is that through advancing in class position, one could actually change one's racial status or classification. The, racial, the idea of racial classification never fell away. But the idea that I want to stress is the increasing importance that Latin Americans placed on economic position, on wealth, on class position as the basis, the most important basis for social hierarchy. And that's one of the most important aspects of the way that colonial Latin America changed during the late colonial period. But there were some other important changes as well. And let me just point out on the outline before I move on that I have the term cedula de gracias al sacar on here um, so that you can see how that is spelled. And that's an important and really, I think, uh, kind of interesting aspect, the idea that you could purchase a change in, if you had enough money, if you generated enough wealth, you could purchase a change in your racial classification. But let's move on to other kinds of changes, because as, as I said at the beginning of this class, 1700 Latin America, colonial Latin America seems very stable. 1825, it's for the most part, not a colonial society, not part of a colonial empire, especially in Spanish America, it's not part of a colonial empire anymore. So in terms of Spanish America, there are some pretty important changes that take place during the 18th century, and I want to start by looking at population and economic change. And I'm going to talk briefly about population change first, because I think the population change is crucially related to the economic changes that developed. Population change was dramatic during the 18th century and the main point here is that population in colonial Spanish America exploded in the 18th century. In 1650 it's estimated that in New Spain or colonial Mexico the population was 1.5 million. In 1810, New Spain had an estimated population of about 6 million. That's a lot of change. In the period between 17, about 1740 and 1790, New Spain's population may actually have doubled. That's an incredible amount of population increase. Even in more sparsely populated areas of Spanish America, in Chile, for example, in 1710, the population was roughly 95,000. In 1815, it was 580,000. Wow, that is a lot of population growth. Overall, there's a great deal of 
growth. The Indian population, the indigenous population, which uh, had been declining in the early colonial period, not only came back, but in some parts of Spanish America uh, was growing exponentially. Did it ever, as a whole, get back to the point it had been in 1492? Probably not, but that's a hard question to answer because there's so much debate about what the size of the indigenous population was in 1492. What is important is that uh, the indigenous population was expanding and the cost of population, the mixed race population, was just growing like crazy. As that happened, there were important changes economically and in terms of productivity in colonial Spanish America that took place as well. And these are very important. Productivity grew rapidly and dramatically during the 18th century. Silver output, for example, increased throughout the 18th century. While Peru's silver output increased during that period, Mexico's not only increased but began to exceed Peru's for the first time. Mexico's silver mines were yielding massive amounts of wealth. But in addition to mining, other active productive sectors where there was a great deal of growth in production were farming and stock raising. And why was that the case? Of course, because the population is growing so rapidly, so dramatically, there's just there's so much demand. It was almost as if it was increasing every single day throughout the 18th century. Uh, commerce and trade were expanding rapidly as well. Trade at both levels of the colonial economy was expanding exponentially. The Atlantic trade, that is the overseas trade, was expanding greatly and that uh, relates to some of the changes in governance I want to talk about in a minute. Um, but intra-American trade was expanding exponentially as well. And in terms of intra-American trade within Latin America, that is, trade was increasing both locally and interregionally. And what that meant was that the internal economy of colonial Sp Spanish America was growing, expanding so rapidly that it was beginning to overshadow the overseas trade. And as that happens, as those changes play out during the course of the 18th century, that lays an important basis for some of the conflicts and issues that will emerge in the 19th century as the independence movements develop. So there's a lot of population growth, and as a result of that, dramatically increased productivity linked to all sorts of economic changes. And let me just mention quickly that that dramatically increased productivity required an enormous and was fueled by an enormous amount of labor. And a lot of that labor was coercive even in the 18th and early 19th century. And the struggle to get to a more free wage labor system was a very difficult one. And because coercion remained a part of the way the economy functioned through the 18th and into the 19th century, that had its own problems and that had some consequences. Let's move on quickly to talk about changes in patterns of governance. And um, let me discuss, begin discussing this issue by mentioning briefly the historian John Lynch, he's actually a British historian who studies both Spain and Latin America, amazingly pro pro prolific. And Lynch is the author of one of the most authoritative discussions of the independence movements in 19th century Latin America. That is a book called Spanish American Revolutions, 1808 to 1826. And he argues, and I agree with this argument, he argues that Spain fundamentally changed the way it governed its colonial holdings during the 18th century and that these changes represented in his ter terms a reconquest. 
this quote unquote new imperialism as he has also referred to this set of changes, this new imperialism would be successful in the short run in that it reinvigorated the imperial relationship between Spain and its new world holdings, but disastrous in the long run because it would cost Spain most of its empire. These changes began early in the 18th century as the ruling family or dynasty of Spain shifted from the Germanic Habsburgs to the French Bourbons. The Bourbon kings brought to Spain a more centralized and activist style of governing. Part of the Bourbon project for improving the place of Spain in Europe was to increase revenues from the Americas. This increase, and this was the activism, this increase would be used to help Spain overhaul its own economy and military, a goal in which the Bourbons were only partially successful. These changes, both political and economic, though ultimately they all have an economic goal, these changes are known overall as the Bourbon reforms, but it's important for me to point out that they are not a single set of reforms which took place at a single point in time. There were many diverse reforms and they took place throughout the 18th century. But let me start by talking about the political changes, because the political changes had some important consequences. The political changes were rooted in the idea that increasing revenue would require more efficient and capable government in the Americas. The Spanish crown, the Bourbon crown, was highly critical, especially of Creole office holders. They thought that peninsulars would um, be more honest and reliable, and that a more centralized and controlled government that is controlled from the top, from the Spanish crown, this more centralized controlled government would devote itself more fully to these new Bourbon goals. Among the political changes were first the creation of new viceroyalties. So in 1700 there were only two the Viceroyalty of New Spain, the Viceroyalty of Peru. By 1750, there were four. And the idea of the establishment of new Viceroyalties was to establish firmer control in Spanish South America, especially because New Spain spa stayed pretty much what it was, but it was Peru that was broken into smaller pieces. Um, and actually, I need to correct myself and say that by 1776, and we know that's an important year, by 1776 there were four viceroyalties. Um, but the idea was that Spanish Peru was broken down into smaller areas that could be more actively governed and defended. Secondly, the Spanish crown established a standing army. It's important to know about the Spanish colonies of the early colonial period that Spain ruled over the Americas until 1700 without a standing army. It did it with militias and uh, with sending troops for certain special circumstances. But during the 18th century, a standing army was established. Spain also established more of a naval presence, and this was to guard uh, its peripheral areas uh, and to, defend, to help defend itself better from threats both internal and external. Finally, this, in political terms, the Spanish created uh, a new level of bureaucracy by, and were trying to invigorate the colonial bureaucracy by creating a new level of bureaucracy, a new type of, uh, of official who these officials were known as intendants. Intendants sat midway on the organizational chart between the viceroys and the uh, corregidores or alcaldes mayores. And the Bourbon rulers and their advisors emphasized filling these and other positions with peninsulars rather than with Creoles. One consequence of this change was to antagonize Creoles who felt their right to colonial office was being undermined. There were also important economic 
changes. Among these were policies designed to increase trade. Uh, the Spanish began to open up trade and free it some way in ways that had not been the case during the early colonial period. They tried to simplify and lower some of the trade-related taxes with the idea that if they siphoned off less in um, shipping taxes, that that might produce more revenue, um, more, more profit, and that the profit could be taxed more easily and that overall that would create more revenue. These changes were, these economic changes were successful. They led to a, a great increase in revenue, much of which went to Spain rather than staying in Latin America. Um, but these economic changes, while positive from the point of view of the Bourbon rulers, also, read to, also led to real social stresses. These changes were associated with an increasing level of tension and conflict within Spanish America. And I want to end my part of class today simply by pointing out that all of the changes that I've talked about, race, class, population, economic change in terms of productivity, and then these political and economic reforms in terms of patterns of rulership, led to an increasingly rebellious climate. In New Spain and in the Andean re region throughout the 18th century, there were more rebellions. Many of these were indigenous in nature. In 1781, however, in what is today Colombia, or uh, the region that then was known as Nueva or New Granada, the Comunera Rebellion of 1781 is a very good example of a mestizo and creole rebellion where peasants and artisans rebelled trying to roll back a series of tax increases. Uh, the participants were, as I said, both creole and mestizo. And the idea was that local councils, known as comunes, and that's where the term communero rebellion comes from, Local councils were popularly elected, and ideas of popular re representation began to emerge. In 1781, this was not connected yet to the idea of independence. In the 1810s and 1820s, these ideas will become much more fully formed. They will become idea attached to the idea of independence, and that's the issue we'll take up in the second part of class today.